Good evening. This is Preacher with Parrots, a.k.a. Pastor Barbara. A couple of the videos you have to look up under Barbara Shelton. Anyway, this is our second program for today. Today is the 22nd of February. And at the time that I'm making this recording, I'm also directing a live show. Does God ever talk about depression in the Bible? Uh, you know what? If you can hang around that long, I'd be happy to talk about some of it after the Bible study. God does not speak specifically about depression, but uh, depression, I think we could look into the Bible into two areas for one would be illness and um, depression is an illness. Uh, it is emotional also. And um, uh, so I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, but know that the specific, as a specific illness, no. But many, many other things that are similar, God does address in the Bible. If I don't get to address it tonight, I certainly will in, in the future. Uh, it's, it's a good question because um, are you talking about Job's? Um, I wasn't thinking about Job, but that's one possible uh, thing that we could discuss. Uh, we're beginning today where we ended off last Sunday. We ended in the 16th verse of the second chapter of Romans. As I started to mention for I realized that I didn't have the camera or YouTube on yet, uh, Romans is at times a little bit difficult to understand, but I, I think we can handle it. Uh, the particular Bible that I'm reading from tonight, Holman Christian Standard Bible, I like the translation because it wasn't translated by words, it was translated by thoughts, by ideas. And as some of you know, I'm a um, uh, retired court interpreter. And uh, there's some words you can't translate, but there are no ideas that can't be translated. And um, when I learned that this, by the newer versions, uh, some of the newer versions are just kind of ridiculous trying to use modern language, uh, there's no use, no need to use a word just because it's modern. Uh, if there are other words that just as many people understand, then there's really no need to make a change. But I like this version, and since I got it, I've been using it. And I started out, and that's the one that I have marked, and this is the one I was in last Sunday when I ended. We ended uh, right after it was talking about God's righteous judgment. Where we're talking now is about the Jewish violation of the law. So at the time that uh, the Apostle Paul is writing this to the Romans, there are no Jews in Rome. However, all of these apostolic letters got sent from one church to the other. Rome is very close to Greece. Uh, there were a number of churches in Macedonia. There was Corinth. Um, there, of course, was the capital of Greece. Uh, there were a lot of churches established that were nearby. And this letter would hit many, many churches, as well as finding its way into our Bible. All right. The governor of Rome decided he didn't want any Jews there. Priscilla and Aquila, as in the case of Paul, the apostle, was Jewish by faith. Uh, he was a Roman citizen. Uh, they were Jewish. They were the head of the Christians, whether they were in one specific church or in five or six, several smaller churches, we don't know. But Aquila and Priscilla, they were a married couple. Uh, it was Priscilla and Aquila that taught 
uh, doctrine to Apollos. Apollos was a great speaker. Uh, we know Paul was the problem solver. Probl Paul was the apostle that God revealed himself to and, and, and gave to the answers of, of some of these difficult problems. But Apollos was a great preacher, great evangelist, sort of like the Billy Graham. He was a little bit off in his doctrine, and when Paul saw how good he was and that he was very teachable, he put Apollos in the hands of Aquila and Priscilla, and uh, they got it straightened out. He, we mentioned this morning, if you haven't seen that video, it's available on um, YouTube. I think the title is, well, it's got today's date on it, uh, 2.22. And it says AM. Uh, but we, we talked uh, a, a bit about that this morning. Okay, where we ended, so we're going to stop now in verse 17. Now, he says, and there are no Jews there, but he either knows that there are some there that, um, hang on, I've got to move my, we have a bunch of people in here. And we've got a pretty good group. And Mary, you made it back. I was concerned about you. I didn't have springtime for a while, and I thought, I really need to have um, an op here while I'm recording. Glad you made it back. Clowny, I haven't seen you for a long time. It's been too long. You know, we're just having a, um, uh, a group, a whole bunch of people from live video. Uh, just kind of a reunion today. Glad to see all of you. Uh, thanks, Clowney. All right. So he is talking to Jews. Of course, the letter has come down to us in our day. It eventually got to the entire church. But at the particular time he's writing this to them, the Jews have been kicked out of Rome. Of course, as you know, you can kick people out and they don't go. So who knows what Paul may have known that the historians didn't know. He says, now, if you call your, yourself a Jew and you rest in the law and you boast in God, and you know his will. In other words, you know, not just to go to temple three or four times a year, Jew, but if you're really a Jew, you really know the law, you're compliant with the law, you're keeping it. You approve the things that are superior. You have been instructed from the law. And you're convinced, oh, this gets good. And you're convinced that you're a guide for the blind. You're, you're not just any Jew, but you, you can teach others. A light to those in darkness. An instructor of the ignorant. A teacher of the immature. You see why I love this version? This is great. If, you're, if you know so much about the law, Having the law, the full expression of knowledge and truth. I mean, the, you know everything about the law. The law is everything to you. You then can teach another. Do you not teach yourself? <laughs> you know so much about it. You preach it to others. Now, let me, let me clarify. Just in case. It is isn't clear, clear already. Uh, I had a neighbor that said, I have to ask you something about the Bible. Uh, and um, he's Catholic. He was uh, went through um, school in a Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through college. He said, is Jewish, is it a religion or is it a nationality? Well, back in those days, 
It was both. The law was given to the Jews, but they were of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's family. They were not only the same race, they were the same family. So there was a time when it was the same. But inasmuch as it's a religion, uh, hang on, let's see. I see I've got a couple of requests here. Let me handle them while I'm thinking about it. And thank you guys for your requests. Oh, I see we're being featured. Also, let's see if, if I'm taking care of it. Okay, I guess I've taken care of all my business here. Um, in as much as it was a religion, there were those who converted. Remember Ruth? She, married, she was a Jewish woman. Her husband was a Jewish man. They had two boys. There was a famine in Israel, so they went to Moab, just over the border to the east. And while they were there, Ruth's husband, or uh, not Ruth, um, the mother's husband died and her two sons died. So there was the mother and the two daughters-in-law. One of them converted. She's the only woman mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. And she's the only non-Jew. But she was a convert. She said to Ruth words which are so beautiful, they're used in weddings. She said, Whither thou goest, I will go. Your God will be my God. Those are words of having converted right there. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Well, she couldn't change the fact that she was born in Moab. But she could change the faith portion. So at the point we are in history right now, being a Jew doesn't exactly mean what it did in the Old Testament because pretty much in the Old Testament being Jewish was being Jewish. It spoke both to the nationality and to the faith. Now we have this problem. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus' birth was in fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. Jewish He was the answer to all of the things that were suggested in the Old Testament. Christ is the fulfillment of all of these things. Those who followed Jesus during the three and a half years of his ministry were Jews. Oh, yes, he did it in, from time to time encounter Gentiles, and they were converted. But then most of the people uh, were in Israel that he contacted. He told them he was setting up a kingdom. Um, tried to explain this. It wasn't all that easy to explain. But he tried to explain that to people. So that when he died, there were two groups of people who could understand his death. Number one, those who had been his followers, his disciples, and many others. They heard him say he was the Son of God. He was going to return to heaven. This morning we had in uh, John 16, pretty close to some of the last words he spoke, because by chapter 18 of John, he's already in the Garden of Gethsemane being arrested by the Roman soldiers. So we have those Jews who heard him much of their adult life and knew that he was the promised Messiah. 
So they were Jews by nationality. Their parents were Jewish. They were Jews by faith. But this Jewish faith has now evolved. And to be a true follower of the Jewish faith is to recognize, oh, we heard Messiah would come. He did come. The better the, they were at their Jewish faith, the better they were at recognizing Jesus was the Messiah. Even during that time he was on the cross, cross, and we realize not many of them were gathered around the cross, but even the time Jesus spent on the cross, he was fulfilling the Old Testament. The first thing he said from the cross is, My God, my God, well, why hast thou forsaken me? Right out of the Old Testament. Then he also said, the last thing he said before he said, it is finished, was, I thirst. He said those words because he knew that the scripture said he would say them. And so they gave him some apple wine that they had handy. He said, I thirst. He drank it. The next thing he said was, it is finished. So much of what Jesus did during those three and a half years is in fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophecy. That the more you knew about Jewishness, the more you had to understand this has got to be Jesus. Well, we had Jews who believed Jesus was Messiah. And they were, those nowadays, are, there's a number of names. One of the terms sometimes used is a completed Jew. One of the terms is um, Messianic Jew. Um, Jewish believer. And then there were the Jews that were good Jews, but they didn't realize Jesus was the fulfillment of everything Jewish. So they were Jewish too. They tended to be more Jewish as a nationality than Jewish as a faith because they kept the Jewish portion of the Jewish faith that was Old Testament law. So we've got two kinds of Jews right now. Plus we got Gentiles at the time this is being written. Uh, Paul is in a Gentile nation when he's writing this to them. So basically three kinds of people. The old-fashioned Jews that don't believe Jesus is Messiah. So for all intents and purposes, they are just as Jewish as back, uh, let's say, 500 years before Christ at the time of the kings. Then we have the Jews who recognized Christ as Messiah and accepted that faith. Then we had the Gentiles who are not Jewish by faith. They're not Jewish by nationality. But although up until this time, everything regarding faith had to do with the Jewish nation, and now we got Gentiles that are believers also. So these are the three kinds of people that Jesus is. Now, when he's talking about how good of a Jew are you, okay, those of you that say you're Jewish, are you really? Is it nationalistic pride? Or are you really keeping the law? That's why he said, those of you that are convinced you're a guide for the blind and you can lead those in darkness, you're an instructor of the ignorant. Oh, man, you are Jewish, 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 Jewish all the way. He said, are you sure you are? Because if you are, 
you better be keeping the law. Because that's what it means to be a Jew, is to keep the Jewish law. Don't go bragging about how many years your family has been Jewish. How many years you've lived in Canaan, the land that was given to the Jewish nation. If, Paul says to them, you're a Jew, I hope you really are keeping the law. Do you commit adultery? Do you detest idols or do you rob temples? <laughs> if you're robbing an, uh, a temple of an idol, it's to rob their idols and have them for your own idols. You who boast in the law, you know all the law. Okay. You know all the law? Do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Uh, I, I want to say hi to all those that have popped in. Uh, we've really got so many people here. I don't have the, all their names on the page at the same time. I have to scroll up or down a little bit. But if you've come since the last time, I welcomed you. I'm so pleased to have you. And I see you're all chatters, which tells me you are all members of iBlog. So I'm pleased because you can chat. Thank you. I do have a better wallpaper. I changed it this afternoon. It's still not what I want. There will be more changes. I was trying to get us ready for the birth, or the hatching, I should say, of the eggs, which will be like a week from tomorrow, will be the first one. Uh, but I never know uh, that... Um, I, I'm sorry, I was reading what somebody wrote. Uh, I And I am also making a video on, on YouTube. So I need to be a little bit less distracted. But um, sometimes when I put a picture up for background, they'll, they'll print it about this big, which means that you get lots and lots and lots and lots of it. What it's done now, it's printed the picture that I put up there about three times, which means you have to see this much in order to get a picture, so you're only getting a part of the bird's head. I had anticipated it would be the opposite, and, and it would just be full of bird's eggs, but it didn't come out that way. And there's no way that I can anticipate what's going to happen. It just whatever happens when I put it up there, that's what happens. Getting back now to Scripture, we're in Romans uh, chapter 2. Here is a very poignant statement. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God? You say you know the law so well. Okay. You know it well enough that you're keeping it. For it's written, this is very heavy. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Gentiles who never heard of God. Ah. But Paul and others are going around the Mideast and Europe and they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're preaching his life he was Jewish. They are now becoming saved. Are you who are at the foundation of faith, which is the Jewish law, you know so much about it, but you don't live up to it. Now, if the Gentiles didn't live up to it, well, they don't know very much yet. A preacher like Apollos, or maybe Luke, or maybe Aquila and Priscilla, maybe Paul himself comes by and they're there six months or they're there a year, and you learn whatever you can learn in the time that you're there. And these 
These Gentiles are doing so much with the little bit of information that they have. Um, and you, who have it all, who know it all, what good is it to have the law if you don't keep it? And the name of God, because these are Jewish people. They're God's people. God's people don't keep God's law. It, it's a shame to those brand new non-Jews who are living as much gospel as, as you can get without printed Bibles, without the printed word, without anything being recorded, uh, a few copies made of different letters. And of course, they had the Septuagint Bible, which is the Greek translation of the entire Old Testament. It was completed 200 years before the birth of Christ. The writing of it was completed 400 years before the birth of Christ. The actual writing down of it and getting it out to people had been completed for 200 years. That's a Septuagint. When Jesus read from the law or from the prophets, he was reading in Greek from the Septuagint. He said, you are such a shame. You are so pitiful. You know so much about the law and you don't keep any of it. Let me accept some requests here. Uh, and thank you guys for for coming and for requesting. Um, okay. Let's see if I got it all. No, nope, got Shirley's. Okay. I think I have, like I said, so many of you, I can't get y'all on the page at the same time. That's a great question. I don't guess you wouldn't call it a mega church. What would you call us? <laughs> mega cast? I don't know. It's great to have you here. Now, we're going on to talk about circumcision. Have we left this paragraph? Do we fully understand it? He's talking to people that call themselves Jews and they know so much about the law, but he's asking them, are you really keeping it? Because if you're not, you're ashamed. Even the Gentiles that have a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of law are doing much better. All right. Now we're going to verse 17. Uh, sorry, we did that. We're going to verse 25. We're talking about circumcision of the heart. What was circumcision? You all know what circumcision is, right? I don't have to explain it to you. Uh, Jewish babies, they do it on the seventh day by Jewish law. Uh, there are some questions uh, among certain cultures one of them just south of the border from us about whether um, circumcision is all that good for baby boys or not. And uh, a couple months ago, there was something in the news here in the Los Angeles area because uh, some hospital had circumcised a boy without getting the parents' permission. I mean, they just assumed all parents wanted their baby boys circumcised. And it's a lot simpler for both the parent and the child and the doctor if they do it while the mother is in the hospital having the baby. So they don't do it on the seventh day, but they do it when it's convenient. And since you're only in the hospital about 24 hours now, they, they do it pretty much after the baby is born. But among the Jewish nation, circumcising the babies at seven days, it meant more than just one thing. It meant, yes, this is a Jew. This is a Jewish male. His parents were Jewish because obviously little boys that are a few days old don't make up their minds about having this surgery. It's done now among those who do it 
who practice it. It's done for hygiene reasons. A uh, matter of folds in the skin and what can get dirty and where germs can harbor and, and all of that. There are some cultures who feel it's less manly. Um, be that as it may, no question among Jews, uh, it does make you Jewish. Um, he says, circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, and we're talking about Jewish law, we're not talking about Roman law at the moment. There are things Romans would not allow them to do. Mostly the Romans, you know, if you're, let's say you're a prison guard. If you can get along with the inmates, it makes your life a lot easier. If you are a part of a nation that is sovereign over other nations, if you can get along with them, it makes it a lot easier. And, and the Romans did try to get along with the Jews. Look at what they did in uh, passing the law that Jesus would be crucified. Remember all of the law up until then, the Jews were trying to say crucify him because he's a liar. You can put somebody for death for being a liar unless, of course, that's Jewish law. And when they realized that Jesus breaking Jewish law was not going to be enough to get the Romans to put him to death because the Romans let the Jews do what they wanted to up to a point. But they said, you just can't come in and just totally practice what you want to practice in our country. We will let you do some things, but other things we, we won't. And only the Jews could put somebody to death. So then they had to make up things that were against Jewish law because there was nothing that was against Roman law that Jesus was guilty of. So it was a bit touchy there. He says, if you're circumcised, okay, that tells us you're a Jew. But if you break the law, where is your Jewishness? Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, well, that could be a Jew that didn't get around to getting circumcised. Remember that every time that the nation drifted away from God and displeased him, they stopped getting around to circumcising the baby boys. And then when there would be judgment on the nation and they realized, oh, oh, God's mad at us, we better shape up. Then they would have a meeting. Now I can tell you the times and places they did. When Joshua brought the people after Moses died and Joshua brought them across the Jordan River and into the promised land, what did he do? They read the law. They read the commandment, they read the prophecies, they read the law. Any babies that weren't circumcised during those 40 years wandering around in the desert, they circumcised them. Some of them were older. I could give you a number of circumstances in the Bible when all of the nation, if they weren't circumcised, got circumcised because it was, it seriously meant you are a Jew. So it says, okay, you're a Jew. But if you don't keep the law, how Jewish are you really? If an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? If being circumcised means you're keeping God's law, You're circumcised, and you're not keeping the law, but here's a guy who doesn't know anything about Jewish law. He's not even Jewish, but he keeps all the law. <laughs> Isn't he 
better than you? For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. You mean outwardly? Well, what people could see and identify. You can see if a person is circumcised or not. So, if a person is outwardly circumcised, and you've got a mark you can see. So I should say that can be seen. But you don't keep the law. On the contrary, a person is a Jew. Remember, Paul is a Jew. He is a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. He is educated at the feet of Gamaliel, the smartest man alive. That's not going to Harvard and Yale folks. His teacher is on the group who of 70, 90, depending on where people who were, had to be consulted on these religious things. You couldn't get much, how much more Jewish than Paul could you get? Paul was one of these Jews that was totally against the believers in Jesus. He got special letters from the religious heads of the church that if he could find that kind of person, he'd bring them back to Jerusalem so that the really, really good Jews could punish them. And he was on his way to Damascus, Syria, when the Lord spoke to him and said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, I'm not persecuting you. And God said, if you're persecuting my people, you're persecuting me. You couldn't get much more Jewish than that. But he said, on the contrary, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not visible in the flesh. True circumcision is a matter of your heart. A matter of keeping God's law. By the Spirit, not of a letter. The letter of the law is means keeping everything specific. If it says don't walk over 14 feet and 2 inches, then you don't walk 14 feet and 3 inches. When it speaks of the letter of the law, that's what it's talking about. Absolutely not. God must be true. But, wait a minute, I, I, just, I skipped a verse. And circumcision is of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. That's pretty clear, right? We don't have anything that we have to um, go back to. I'm ch double checking now to see if there's anything I need to do. Okay. Now we go to chapter 3. And I'm wondering, we're about 40 minutes into our video. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be good to close the video at this time. Well, let's give it a little bit longer. We'll go to chapter 3. Paul answers an objection. What advantage does the Jew have? If you're Jewish, so, how are you better off than anybody else? You know, I haven't checked the birds. I only see um, one of them. 
Uh oh. Excuse me. Oh, I, I guess they're okay up there. Uh, this is not the one that's part of the pair. She's off by herself here. And I, I really need to go raise the, the door to the cage so they can get in their cage. They have a, a little rope here that I fixed for them. Okay, Pickle. Go over there now. And you too. Okay, well, we've got one of them that's now down at the bottom of the stairs. So I'll just leave them alone for a little bit. Now, he said, all right, what should you feel about being Jewish? Yeah, she's, she's up here. And we've got one back there, and we've got another one that went downstairs. What is the benefit of circumcision? How does that make you better than anybody else? Why would anybody want to be circumcised? Consider in every way. First, they, meaning the Jews, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. Even before there was much that was written, you know that Moses did the first writing. Moses and Joseph. Moses and Abraham lived at the same time. Aside for Job, everything we know for the first 2,000 years was written by Moses. He got his information by revelation. That's sort of backwards prophecy. Prophecy is knowing by revelation what's going to happen in the future. And by revelation, he knew what was going on in the Garden of Eden, even though he wasn't there. Those were the spoken history, law. First, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. What then? If some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? We have to reread this. What's the advantage of being a Jew? Those of you that are still circumcised Jews, you have an advantage? Well, it was you and yours that God entrusted. He didn't tell the Egyptians what he was going to do. The Egyptians didn't write any of our Bible. They didn't keep any of our history. It was those, that nation of Jews. Abraham being the first one. If some didn't believe, does that cancel out God's faithfulness? Let's say we went through a period in history in which we don't see any Christians living for God and doing great things. Is that because that's God's not doing good stuff? Or is it that the people are not faithful and enjoying the benefits of God? The fact that nobody's enjoying the benefits of God, is it God's fault? Will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not! Exclamation point. God must be true, but everyone is a liar, 
as it is written. He's quoting somebody else. That you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. Let's go on with a couple more verses. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness. Whoa, wait a minute. If the fact that we have people that are living in sin proves that God can forgive sin. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? If God punishes people, let's say with famine, with death, with something, is he being righteous, doing the right thing, or not? Is God unrighteous if he inflicts wrath? Of course not, says Paul. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? God has to be able to look at the world and say, look, this is what you knew. This is what God showed you. This is what you did with what you knew. You could have kept God's law, and you didn't. And by that, I don't mean the Ten Commandments or the Old Testament law. I mean what God tells me. Absolutely not. But if by my lie, God's truth is amplified in his glory. Wait a minute. This is getting difficult to understand. If by my lie, God's truth is amplified, so I lie. So I commit sins. But if my committing sins shows people that God is able to forgive sins. But if by my move, not my lie, God's truth is amplified to his glory, why am I so also judged as a sinner? Hmm. I'm a sinner. And because I am, People can understand that Christ died for my sin and it's possible to be saved. So if the fact that I sin convinces some people they should get saved, do I die in the end? And why not? Just as some people slanderously claim, we say, let us do evil, so that good may come. How in the world can good come out of doing evil? Well, for one thing, God forgives. Maybe some people aren't real bad, and so they don't think about coming to God. But now that they do bad, and God punishes that, and some people have come to God, well, haven't they had part in something good happening? Let us do evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. In other words, the fact that we may be a small player in the world learning about Jesus, if we don't keep his laws, we're not going to be forgiven. I'm going to close our video at this time, and I need to take care of some of these birds. So give me, whoa, there goes my, my uh, let me close the video. We'll be back in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three days. Until next time, blessings on you.